He said, I thought you was a Christian. I said, bro, what does that have to do with, okay. this is about three, four, this is 2018. I was like, bro, what does that have to do with anything? He said, I thought you said you were a Christian. I said, I am. He was like, bro, you think he wants it in a pimp hand or you want an E.T. the Hip Hop Preacher hand? You, you think he wants it in a drug dealer's hand or you want it in Eric Thomas' hands? And I was like, wow. You're able to do more with resources. Simple as that. There's nothing else to it. And those resources that we use today is the dollar, it's money. So it's a waste to not use your talents that God's given you to go out there and do something big with it. It's a waste of time if you don't do it. It's almost an insult if you don't do it. And so faith is the only reason that I believe failures, setbacks, mistakes are propelling us, promoting us, and protecting us. And as long as we learn the lesson, we'll get there a lot faster. The kingdom of God is within you. You can't have a kingdom without a king. Kings rule. You must master the king in you. Let's demystify a little bit about church and money. Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes people say, well, you know, Matt, your, your YouTube channel or you guys talk about uh, being faith-based, but it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle, and or God will just want you content. God just wants you, and and yet people are not paying the bills. Yet people aren't tithing. People aren't giving offering. They're not building the kingdom, at least from a financial standpoint. They're not expanding it. We all know that ministries need finances. So, can you speak to that in in terms of help? help maybe that's a myth. Maybe that's a myth. If we if we look at the difference between what I do and what ministers do. Ministers preach the gospel about Jesus. I preach the gospel that Jesus preached. <laughs> they sell the messenger. I sell his message. Boom. When they demanded of the Jewish carpenter when the kingdom of God shall come, he said, he didn't talk about brick and mortar, some building, the kingdom of God cometh not by observation. They shall say, it's neither low there, low here. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. You can't have a kingdom without a king. Kings rule. You must master the king in you. Most of us have been programmed to fail. Most of us are being manipulated by the media, by computers. Studies indicate that most people look at their phone over 400 times a day. They've given up control, the real estate of their mind, the kingdom within, to commercial advertising. They've been programmed to be fans, to be spectators as opposed to being co-creators and how they're going to live their lives. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, the future belonged to those who created. We were born to create. And so this time where we are, this place where we are, mm -hmm. people should not be focused on the television set and what's going on in the Ukraine, and my heart goes out to them and my prayers and my support for them. But they should be focused on what kind of person must I become that will help me to learn how to turn adversity to my advantage. Because life is going to always be challenging. Mm -hmm. Think it not strange that you're face to fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might, you will have tribulations. It's a part of the process. And so our goal is, is to master your kingdom. That, that we have to go within, as we say, that you don't live life as it is, you live life as you are. And so when, if we train our children how to live their lives from the inside out as opposed to the outside in, we can reduce the dropout rate, the suicide rate, the unexplained violent behavior, people mm. fighting over toilet paper yeah. in a grocery store or fighting over a parking spot. 
that's somebody that's not in their right mind. And so people are breaking down to a very large extent. But the people that will make it through this place where we are, there's an African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. And Shakespeare said, the four dear Brutus is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. If, if people take the time, a minimum of two to three times a day, to get still, to get quiet, to go within, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth thee, and listen to the whispering of your soul. What am I supposed to do next? As opposed to listening to the world. Yeah. What you tune into, you turn into. So in this space, we have to focus on how to begin to elevate ourselves above the culture, above all the stuff that we see, and focus on the whole vision of what we want to manifest. My favorite book says, I'll give you all your eyes can see. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. Mess with you, you might run over here, but you'll limp back. Don't mess with me. <laughs> a lot of viewers on Sam Fear Squad are also faith-based. And, and obviously, uh, the thought process of making a million dollars, for some of them, they've been given this narrative in church that, you know, to be rich, to be wealthy, you know, it's easy for a camel to go to an eye of a needle yep. and a rich man to get into heaven. Yep. So a lot of them feel that I shouldn't become wealthy. And yeah. you're, you're, for a large part of your life, you're an atheist. And yeah, since the uh, large part of uh, PHP was a, this pastor named Pastor yeah. Dudley Rutherford, who, who immensely blessed uh, you know, your, your business endeavors, can you talk to us about your faith? Yeah, no question about it. So I remember one time I sat down with Dudley, and I said, Dudley, listen, I'm going through this struggle, the same thing you just said right now. I was 24, 25 years old. And I said, man, do I, do I go become a pastor? Do I go do this? What am I supposed to do? I want to serve my purpose the right way. He says, no, he says, God chooses people to go through different endeavors to make their own impact. Yours is business, you stick to business. Go in at the highest level, just remember to not forget and give praise to the man upstairs because without him. So, yeah. you know, to me, I, I think sometimes the, if, you, if you allow the enemy, say the enemy doesn't believe in what you believe in, but the enemy has more resources than you. He can make a bigger impact than you can. Say you got a better vision, say you got a better cause than the enemy does but you don't want to go out there and make money, you can't really make an impact. But if you got the money, yeah. you go work your tail off and you make whatever that number is going to be for you, the 100 grand, a million, 10 million, a billion, whatever the number may be for you that you want to go get, you're able to do more with resources. Simple as that. There's nothing else to it. If you have a great vision, if your cause is solid, if the values and principles you follow mm -hmm. as a Christian man is solid, you need resources to grow it. And those resources that we use today is the dollar, it's money. So it's a waste to not use your talents that God's given you to go out there and do something big with it. It's a waste of time if you don't do it. It's almost an insult if you don't do it. Sure. Now going into the next year, 2022, yeah. at the recording of this video, we're still in 21. You know, oftentimes we talk about recreation, you know, uh, getting yourself to the next level in your life. So if somebody's watching this right now and they say, okay, PBD, I want to take my life to the next level, uh, what are some of the basic uh, uh, fundamentals you'd be looking for to recreate themselves so that they, they can control their cash flow in 2022 because a lot of them were obliterated the last couple of years. They've been dependent on government, dependent on draining their 401k, yeah. the credit cards, the whole thing. Yeah. How can they make sure they're financially set and squared away for the next year ahead? Yeah, you, you know, everybody goes into a new year and they say, oh, I got big goals. I'm going to do big things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I always ask the question, what's different about you this year than last year? Tell me. <laughs> and it's always like, well, I'm just more serious. Tell me why. I, I'm just more dedicated. Tell me why. I'm just so committed, explain to me why, right? The biggest thing is you don't want to go into a new year being the same person you were. It's almost like going to a party and you haven't seen your friends and family for the last six months, okay? The best compliments your friends and family are gonna give you is what? I don't recognize you anymore. Something's changed about you. What's up with your, uh, your walk? The, the words you're using, I'm not accustomed to that. That's a compliment versus people see you six months later, you're the same exact person. You haven't changed at all. Yeah. You're still using the same language. You're still using the same stuff. Everything's still the same. You ain't changing. You want the greatest compliment in the world is where the people close to you say, I don't recognize you anymore. The way you do that, there's a logical side to it. There's an emotional, emotional side to it. The logical side is skill set, having a plan, supporting cast, having the right systems. That's all logical. The emotional side is having the right enemy you know, having the right mission, being clear about the vision, having the strong willpower, you're working on your willpower where 
typically in 2021, when something bad would happen, you would have a setback, you'd be so weak and out of it for two or three weeks, you know, you lose momentum. In 2022, you're working on your willpower. You have a setback, it's only gonna steal three hours of your day, no more than that. I'm not giving you more than three hours. These are small, subtle things that you have to pay attention to to work on yourself going into a new year. Emotional and logical, but it's gotta be changes where people say, I don't recognize you anymore. Politics, yeah. sex, yeah. and money. Yeah. How can yeah. we improve that? I talk about all of it. Okay. Why? Because it's in the word. Yeah, yeah. All of it is in the word. Um, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, they were in politics. Like they worked with King Nebuchadnezzar. They made decisions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. Joseph made decisions yeah. for the king. Sure. You know, the he, Pharaoh. Yeah, he, he, right he made there. decisions for Pharaoh. Yeah. That was politics. So politics are all in the Bible. But when you don't know the Bible, or you're learning the Bible from some preacher, and I'm saying, you, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn from a preacher, but you should study to show yourself approved. You know that God has put us in politics. He put Joseph there so that Joseph could be an example for him. Yeah. And now Pharaoh is saying, yo, we serving Joseph God from this day forward. Yeah. Uh, Darius is saying, yo, we going with Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, God. Yeah. They God look like they're bringing favor to our, you know, to our nation. Uh -huh. So politics are there, sex is there. Um, uh, you know, David, which is one of my favorite characters, sure. when David is old and sick, the way they figure out he's sick is they put a young lady in the bed with him and he doesn't respond. And they're like, <laughs> David's sick. Yeah, something's wrong with David because David never responds like this. Yes. The female, uh, uh, Samson and Delight, like sure. it, it's all in there. Uh, Adam and Eve, sex is all in there. And I feel like if you let people who are not godly educate you on it, they're not going to educate you like the Bible's ed educated. Wow. Sex, all of it. I'm talking to wow. my daughter. She's 23. I'm like, yo, let's, we got to talk about it. And, and there's a way to do it. And you might not even do it the way the Bible says that you're going to do it. <laughs> but you need to know what the Bible says yeah. because that's your benchmark. And if you fall, you need to know what you can do to get back up. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. man, we got to talk about all of Let me tell you something. I had a friend rebuke me, um, a white male friend. And I just say that to put this in context. He did some uh, uh, mentoring with me and he said to me, Eric, how much money you want to make? And I was like, bro, why is it that that's all y'all talk about? Money, 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 money. He said, I thought you was a Christian. I said, bro, what does that have to do with? Okay. This is about three, four, this is 2018. I was like, bro, what does that have to do with anything? He said, I thought you said you were a Christian. I said, I am. He says, well, don't you want to build churches for God? Don't uh -oh. you want to evangelize? There you go. Don't you put kids through school? I was there like, yeah. He said, how many? I said, three. He said, you think God only wants ET to hip hop preacher on. to send three people <laughs> to school? He was like, bruh, you think he wants it in a pimp hand or you want an ET to hip hop preacher hand? There you, go. you think he wants it in a drug dealer's hand or he want it in Eric Thomas hands? And I was like, wow, wow, that makes sense. So yeah. I'm on a quest to become a billionaire and not for me. Like I don't have expensive stuff and I don't think there's nothing wrong with it. That's just not my swag. But now I'm using my money, my wife and I, and a group of people were able to renovate a, a medical facil facility and turn it into a church. Spent about a half a million dollars, you know. Um, and it takes money. It took I mean, money. You, you and, and, do this and we were blessed to have money. it and yeah. we're making investments now. Yeah. We're trying to get as much as we can because people like Bill Gates sent some of my students from Detroit who came to Michigan State to school. Bill Gates don't even know them. Yeah. But he gave them an opportunity to go to school. Yeah. They didn't have the money to go on their own. So I'm like, yo, Bill Gates yeah. is sending kids from Chicago and Detroit, and yeah. he never been there. Yeah. Then what does God want you to do? Yeah. So yeah, more money, more, more money, money, more, more money. money. <laughs> Tell Dion when, I, when you see him, I said, yeah. must be the money. <laughs> must be the money. God is saying, yeah. I want money in your hand because you're going to steward it right, and you're going to use it for my, uh, to advance my cause. Yeah. A large part of your story was going through hardship. And, uh, you know, I, I want to drill. I got some follow-up questions to that because I've seen you. I think a lot of people have seen you on line and TV and your IG. Talk about that. All You're always referencing that that was the best experience that happened to your life. How come, how come you embraced that hardship as one of the best experiences of your life? Because before I understood it was the best uh, thing that could happen to me, I didn't have faith. See, I, I lived trying to go get things I already had because I had no faith. I was trying to get wealthy, get healthy, get worthy, get happy when I already was. Mm -hmm. And without the hardship, and the analogy that I give is my mom's to me a saint. Second grade teacher, raised six kids on her own, sure. packed my dinner in a paper bag so she could go fill up humbly turnstiles at convenience stores with greeting cards just so we could eat empowered all six of her children to be passionate, purposeful, and profitable. Uh, 
She believed the fetus wasn't fully developed. So after graduate school, all my siblings went to the Ivy Leagues, graduated summa cum laude, wow. extraordinary scholars, Harvard, wow. Penn, and Columbia. Wow. And I grew up happy with nothing. Okay. Um, but the faith in my life was that I had to go get everything. And, and that validated you. It did. And I remember when I was three, I reached out to touch a hot stove. Uh -oh. And my mom, who my wife will tell you, David's problem is his mom never hit him. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right? Never got beat. <laughs> exactly. Because I had no dad, right? So I reach out to t touch a hot stove and my mom slaps the back of my hand and screams, no. Well, I'd never been hit by my mom. You remember that at three years old? Oh, because she had never even yelled at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was terrified and I just started to cry. I'm like, what did I do? Why are you punishing me? And she yeah. just grabbed me and hugged me and said, I I'm not punishing you, I'm protecting you. I'm promoting you. And later on in life, I started to realize when I didn't get the job, I didn't get the deal, I didn't get into Stanford, I didn't get what I wanted in life, the girl left me, cheated on me, whatever happened, the pain, the heartaches that you talk about, the mm -hmm. suffering, when I lost everything, yeah. over $100 million, I then realized that there is something bigger than me, an omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source. Unlike my mom, my mom's ignorant and humble. Yeah. But this is an omniscient. They know everything. Yeah. So when I don't get the job, when I have failures, setbacks, and mistakes in my life, all of a sudden it clicked in my head. This source loves me more than my mom loves me. I must be protected and promoted <laughs> as if I'm touching a hot stove. And that nuance, that paradigm shift made me realize I am happy. I mm -hmm. am healthy, I am wealthy, I'm worthy. What am I doing to interfere with it? Because just as if I would ask my mom for something and it was gonna be good for me, something better for me, a better place, a better situation, she'd put me in there immediately. So will this source. Mm -hmm. And so faith is the only reason that I believe failures, setbacks, mistakes are propelling us, promoting us and protecting us. And as long as we learn the lesson, we'll get there a lot faster. It's interesting that you say that because a lot of people don't want to buy in it, into that today. And I the, didn't. The, the I didn't. Right. Because the kind of argument is, well, let me cry long enough. Let me complain long enough because that's who gets the mic today. Because back, back in the day, the people that were behind the mic were the winners. Yeah. But today, the people that got the mic are also the complainers and the winners. And the complainers seem to have a larger megaphone. Yeah, the why me's have a bigger than the try me's. Oh, right. The why me's are bigger than the tribes. That's that's a meme right there. So <laughs> so when, when, when you're looking at um, your ability to pick yourself back up again, that's a hundred million dollars. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. Two, two things stick out to me. Number one, you when you went to your mother and she's like, what do you need, honey? Do you need money? Changed my life. You need money. Listen, her son was hundred million dollars. Your you, mother's. You realize asking I you. lost her house too. So not right. only did I have to go tell her I lost everything, but I forgot to take the house out of my name. And the only reason I wanted to be rich when I was young was to buy her that house and a car. Wow. wow. And she just didn't care. She was like, I thought. I said, Did you hear me? I literally said to her, Did you hear what I said? She goes, yeah. I heard you. I get choked up. Huh? Are you okay? Yeah. Do you need any money? Huh? And I got something clicked in my head that this is unconditional love. It's different than trading a credit, quid pro quo, a scarce world of zero sum game. My mom would always say, don't play the zero sum game. I said, what do you mean? She said, there, there's enough of everything for everyone. What do you want? You live in a world of more than enough. Trust me. And I learned to trust her. Now, let me ask you a question. So what do you feel like it means to be a spirit filled, entrepreneur or an entrepreneur that has a like that that do you feel like god calls people specifically to be be entrepreneurs uh i think all of us to some extent has some form of entrepreneurial duty and what does really an entrepreneur do the definition of entrepreneur is one that takes risk everything in life is a risk and you know the, the whole safe sound you know safe secure type route isn't necessarily the route that the good Lord wants you to walk in because he wants you to continue to push in the envelope. He continue wants to expand the territory. He continue wants to, to, div, di, to if you believe that uh, the good Lord is your savior and, and, and he is about your, that's about your life, that's what you want to do is glorify his name if that's what you feel called upon to do, well, then you've got to take risk. And, and sometimes you got to say, I don't have all the skills, but Lord, and this is one thing I love about entrepreneurship. 
You don't know when the next client's going to come. You don't know how to get out of a financial pit sometimes. You don't know all the answers. But if you pray and exercise that faith and you knock, the Bible says, listen, knock, and the door shall be opened. Well, right? And then so therefore the answer can enter in. But so my question is, to begin with, why do you let wisdom knock on the door? Shouldn't that door be open already? Shouldn't you already be asking questions? Shouldn't you be already asking, hey, listen, can I empty my cup? Can, can I be filled? And I think everybody, to some extent, has some form of entrepreneurial skills. What, what's, what's having a family? What's the purpose of family to take this gift of a, as, a, as a husband and a wife and to create more generations, right? To, to, to take that risk of raising children. I remember when I had my, my I got answered, I had kids, twins on, on top of that. I remember just, just bawling in my car, not because it was tears of joy, but like tears like, how am I going to put this together? How am I going to make ends meet? I can barely make this right now. But it's through that faith, that express faith. I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? What, what, what do I need to close that you can close when only door can you only open? And when I started asking myself those type of questions, not, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Woe is me. Uh, I'm a, uh, because, you know, uh, I live in the city of Chicago. I can't afford it. I need to lean on somebody else. No, no, I asked. And by the way, I've never leaned on the government for anything, even though I, I could fit that profile. I said, Lord, what can I lean on that you can send my way? And it wasn't government. The answer was never the government. The answer was, okay, I got you this conversation. You need to pick up the phone and talk to this person. You know, uh, open up this bank account and fill this, fill this one up. Right? Whatever the case may be, it was never upon leaning on somebody that can pay my bills. I lean on a good source, a good book to pay my, res- to, to pay my bills. Hey, man. Well, what do you think about, there, there seems to be a tone sometimes that um, don't mix faith and business. Um, you know, those are two separate areas of, of life. Do, do you believe that? I don't because I think, I, because how you do one thing is how you do everything. Exactly. I think, I think, you know, it's, and don't, don't mix faith and politics. Why? Well, wasn't it Nathan, the prophet that called out David on his sin? You know, when, when you, when you looked at, when you looked at how things were created in the Bible, if you read in the word, everything was mixed in, everything was introduced. Uh, if you look at even the way back in England, I'm, I was watching this uh, this this movie uh, on the way back on American Airlines, The Last Duel, right? The Last Duel. Uh, it was a very interesting movie where where the church was the court. <laughs> the church was the court. Uh, the the removal of how we live about. I mean, the way our country was created through Judeo Christian principles, right? We the people, right? That uh, uh, that we come here to this country. That people, this, this country was created based on those principles of faith and those things. And why did those get removed? And now that those things have been removed from our school system, now you see the craziness that's going about in our school system, the craziness going about in our country, the craziness going on in our finances, the craziness going on in our relationships, where you remove certain values and principles that the good book has allowed us to understand and how it's transcended the, the, the test of humankind. I think I think by going back and revisiting, and I think that a lot of people have been rejecting it because they don't like having religion shoved down their throat. I totally understand that. And I think I think us as believers need to sell our faith better than than damning people to hell. Of course, yes. And one of the things I do also think that there's a tacky way to go about it to where you can kind of let like the reason to do business with me is because of my faith or like, Um, I, I, no offense to if anyone has like a little fish on their business card that I, that is okay in certain circumstances, but that's not quite the point. Why don't I show you uh, my character and my integrity, um, my ethics, my principles that are biblically based. And that should make me the best businessman that you've ever come across without even talking about it. But then if we can get into the, why are you so successful and excellent and wise, et cetera? Well, Hey, look, just cause I've just taken the opportunities that my dad walked me into because Psalms 23 says he's a shepherd. He goes before you. He makes a way. He'll create a banquet table in front of your enemies. And if that's not a business scripture, then I don't know what is, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that to me is is how I, because there's a lot of weird, tacky, like weird ways to like, because you can, I think you can mix faith and business improperly and create this weird pressure of like, or going to like your church and like using that as a prospecting thing only. And it's like, well, I'm a believer at here. So you owe me a meeting and all that kind of stuff is awkward. Mm-hmm. Just you, just stand on your principles and your faith, and then if it gets into why are you so successful and how did you become so, then you can open up that. Well, here's actually why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I'm not trying to, you know, I'm, I'm doing this with with purpose, and God's called me to do this. In fact, I've been in situations I'm sure you two have been too, Matt, where I've told God like entrepreneurship has been so hard for me at certain points in my life, 
that if, if I was not supposed to be an entrepreneur, then I wouldn't be one because God has bailed me out so many times. Like there is probably 10 yeah. different scenarios where I'm looking at like the money in the bank account and the payroll expenses coming up and it ain't there. And then all of a yeah. sudden, like a client comes or a relationship comes or something comes. And so if God wanted me out of the entrepreneurial world, then, then I would be out. And I also will tell you too, there's been times where it's gotten hard enough for me to say, you know what, maybe I should go. Uh, I'll just simplify the, the the thought in my head was maybe I should just go preach and teach and, and whatever. And truly, as I as I thought and I meditated on that and I was in God's word, I really felt like God telling me, if you do that, you are quitting yeah. what I'm asking you to do. And you are mm-hmm. taking the easy, easy route in your case. Lane. And that doesn't mean that some people aren't called away from business in the ministry. That doesn't mean that ministry is, yeah. is less than I'm not going there. I'm just saying for me in my journey, there's been times where it's been, look, like like I'm at the end of my rope, what happens and God had delivered me time and time and time again. And outside of my family um, and my father, like I have three kids. So outside of my, my wife, my marriage and my three children, nothing has taught me more about my father than business and entrepreneurship. Would you agree with that? Uh, oh man, a hundred percent, you know, and as much as you think that uh, your business, you're trying to perfect your business or you're trying to perfect your kids, it's, it's actually the other way around. <clears throat> There's been some some great training grounds of uh, how to go about living life. And really, it's one thing to read a scripture on Sundays, but implementing it in business, implementing your life Monday through Saturday, that's what entrepreneurship and the insurance industry has allowed me to do, to actually express it. Because as a provider, if I say to myself, well, how am I going to put the food on the table and the roof over our heads and create opportunities for, for children to go to this schools and, and, and take advantage of these things. Well, I have to be better today than I was yesterday. And if I deviated from things that kept me from becoming better, then I'm just only hurting my, my loved ones. And so in hurting my business, if I don't improve. And when you're looking at, when you look at so many things in, in, in the Bible and just forget, forget, you know, you just take yourself in this scenario, the people that have hurt me the most, have actually been Christians. I've had a Christian book publishing company basically squeeze me for 5,000 bucks because I didn't want them to publish a draft I had of a book because I wasn't gonna meet their deadline. So I actually bought the rights of that book back just so they wouldn't put, just so they wouldn't push a, a half cock type of work because that's my name on it. Yeah. Exactly. The, the people that in my personal life have stabbed me in the back the most were, were Christians. But it doesn't mean I don't love God. And I, what I realized is that, listen, they are human beings that by grace, listen, Jesus gave his life to me, not because I deserved it, but because by, by grace. So why should I judge people who stab me in the back? If my relationship was not vertical, but more horizontal, I'd be hurt many different times because it was a faith on a vertical relation between me and my relationship with, with, with God and my creator uh, up in heaven. Who knows where I'd be? And thank God for God.